The reproductive processes are among the most complicated and delicate found in the animal world, and there are numerous stages at which it should be possible to interfere simply and effectively with the sequence of events without harm to either partner. So, why is the pill only for women right now, and will we ever see that change? The development of the birth control pill was a defining moment in human history. It allowed women to control their reproductive health and have greater control over their lives. The pill, as we know it today, is a hormonal oral contraceptive that prevents ovulation in pregnancy. But the history of the birth control pill is long and complex, rooted in cultural, social and political issues, and the serendipitous nature of scientific research with the availability of new chemical substances. Somewhat conveniently, the last two books I've read have covered the history of biological research revolving around sex and hormones, and a book about the discovery and commercialisation of the pill. In fact, the opening quote I used was taken from this book I recently read called Sex, Science and Society by A.S. Parks. The other book is This Man's Pill by Carl Duressi. So, by blending these books with my extra reading and humour, together we'll go from the history to the present, so some thoughts on the future of how reproductive control can be most effectively managed, and see current work looking for a pill for men. So, the development of the pill could not begin until scientists had any idea what was going on with fertility and reproduction, so our story really begins in the late 1800s, when many isolated researchers reported on the blocking of ovulation by the corpus luteum. The corpus luteum is a mass of cells that forms in an ovary. It is a temporary organ that appears every menstrual cycle and disappears if fertilisation doesn't occur. The scientists here were simply observing this in animal experiments, with no consideration of ever translating this to human hormonal contraception. This, however, was the aim of Ludwig Haberland's experiments from the beginning. Haberland, also known as the father of hormonal contraception, was a professor of physiology at the University of Innsbruck, who in 1919 transplanted under the skin of an adult non-pregnant rabbit, the ovaries of a pregnant rabbit. Though the recipient of the graft had easily become pregnant before, she was now infertile for about two and a half months after the transplantation, despite frequent coitus. Already in this report, Haberlant stressed his opinion that hormonal sterilisation by injection or oral administration, ideally of ovarian extracts, might be tried in women. And he called this approach temporary hormonal sterilisation. He also used an analogy to explain his logic. If you don't want to let a vehicle park in a space, then block this place by pretending this place is occupied. Similarly, this should work physiologically in the body of a woman, where the contraceptive mimics a pregnant state. Hormones will block the way to the uterus so egg and sperm cannot meld, thus the way to the uterus is blocked. In this way, contraception is a pretended pregnancy by hormones. However, Haberland's ideas was controversial at the time. Despite publishing and presenting his findings, his ideas conflicted with the moral, ethical and religious beliefs of the time, leading to public backlash and his eventual suicide in 1932. Later research showed that the hormone responsible for this effect was progesterone, and had Haberland lived, there is no question that he would have pursued his dream of temporary hormonal sterilisation in humans without resorting to glandular extracts. But even with pure progesterone, he could have shown only that ovulation can be inhibited by injection. For oral administration, he would have needed another steroid, not naturally occurring, but waiting to be synthesised, and that took 20 more years. So this next part of the story takes us to Mexico, where a company called Syntex were able to create an orally available version of progesterone that they could manufacture cheaply from yams. Progesterone was being used at the time for the treatment of menstrual disorders and certain conditions of infertility. However, these required injections of high doses of progesterone, which is very painful. This brings us to Duressi, Don's the father of the pill, to make a powerful progesterone compound. With his team, they created norethisterone, also called norethidrone, which chemically mimics progesterone and is still widely used today in various forms and doses. This happened in 1951, with the first pill produced in the USA, Enovid, being produced in 1960. But what if the pill had never been created? 
According to Jurassic, the pill was born at the best possible time, in the early 1950s, the heyday of new drugs, but also a rather short window of opportunity. By contrast, the 1960s appeared to be the worst of times. The changed climate was triggered by the thalidomide tragedy, which resulted in the births of hundreds of children with serious limb deformities. This thalidomide tragedy in the 1960s raised everyone's consciousness of the importance of prior teratological studies in animal models before introducing a drug that pregnant women may consume. While this would now seem somewhat self-evident, prior to 1960 it was not. Then, in the 1970s, there was the Dolken Shield, an intrauterine device that the founder Hugh Davis claimed was safer than the pill. Turned out, however, it wasn't with Dolken Shield users starting to suffer from increased rates of serious infection, permanent infertility, and in the worst case, death. This of course is unacceptable, and it is to some extent why it has taken so long to see any progress with the development of a male contraceptive. Or is the lack of a male pill due to biological limitations? To find out, I spoke with Akash Bakshi, co-founder and CEO of Your Choice Therapeutics. So the question is, did the mechanisms of action already exist such that we could have developed a male contraceptive? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there have, I mean, there was a phase three clinical trial that was being conducted on a hormonal male method, a hormonal male contraceptive pill. And that study was stopped. Uh, because of the perception of side effect profile on men. So this is to say that we have known, we have known that the use of hormones can prevent spermatogenesis, which thereby is a a male contraceptive. Uh, It is just that the risk benefit profile does not meet what we, what is acceptable for the development of, of a male contraceptive. In fact, people have known how to modulate spermatogenesis for the intended outcome. I think that maybe it is a societal question of what what risk profiles are acceptable for men to take on. In your company, you're trying to develop a non-hormonal oral male contraceptive. And so I was just wondering, what was the backstory um, to this um, initiation of the project? Yeah, actually, this actually ties to the uh, previous question that I remember, which was, you know, did we not know how to modulate sperm cell? Or did we not know how to biologically develop a male method? And yes. that ties into how did we decide to, to focus on this? So, um, you know, contraception as a field gets like a pittance of, a, of funding. Yeah, you know, I think... Rare diseases often have more cash thrown at uh, at their indications than do male contraception. Or, th- excuse me, than contraception. Mm. And that is because there's a perception that contraception is a solved problem. We're done here. There's no need for more innovation. Uh, that is an that I believe is an opinion. When we were thinking about the development of a non-hormonal male method, the question on our side is, you know, we're not going to, or the rationale here, or think thought process here was that we're not going to have a lot of cash. So we have to do with a little cash what others can do with a lot of cash. So, you know, traditionally, if if we were an oncology company, you know, we would go after, and I, I think, uh, there have been a number of companies recently that have gone public or been acquired on using kind of exotic new biology to try and to try and solve you know particular issues within oncology. Would we actually be in a position to do work like that? And I think the answer is no, uh, because there's not as much cash available for solving issues in contraception. So what we were led to is think, okay, you know, we don't we don't have the chance that this is not going to work. So what do we know works in men? And how do we ensure that uh, it will all work? Uh, and that way, when we when we do assessments in animals, we know biologically, you know, th- this may or may not matter. But what we have seen is that this works in humans. And that is what resulted us in looking at um, 
retinoic acid receptor alpha. So uh, in the literature, it had been known that men who were vitamin A deficient were subfertile. This had, for 100 years in the 1920s, this was understood. And in the 1950s, in men, there were studies done on the vitamin A signaling pathway, not on, not on inhibiting vitamin A itself, but actually modulating a target pharmacologically um, called aldehyde dehydrogenase. And in these men, it was also shown sperm counts fell when you uh, modulated ALDH1A. And so it was clear that, you know, modulation of this target of, of the vitamin A signaling cascade could work. The question that you're left with is like, well, vitamin A is very important everywhere. Do you really want to just shut this off? And so the answer to that was clearly no. What is the last step in the vitamin A signaling pathway that you could modulate that would prevent spermatogenesis? And that is what resulted in us inhibiting retinoic acid receptor alpha. Inhibition of retinoic acid receptor alpha results in decreased spermatogenesis and not and not just in one species. You know what I mean? So I think I often look at um, my friends who are running um, biotech companies in oncology. They have these very strange studies that they've done in mice to kind of show that their molecule, their modality may work. And we also, I mean, the, the first study that was done um, was done in mice. Um, but, you know, subsequently, we did studies in rats, dogs, and non-human primates, and the findings are all the same. And so in our mind, it is kind of, we were certain that this was going to work. I didn't know it was going to work, you know, broadly in all these species, but I think broadly we knew that this was going to work. And I think how, how lucky that we are, A, that that um, we were able to work with researchers at the University of uh, Minnesota who developed the molecule, universities of Columbia who uh, did the original mice work to show that this worked and, and ultimately that we're in a position uh, that can yeah, try and keep moving forward to commercialize this molecule. Nice. So I understand the logic that by targeting the retinoic acid receptor, it's like downstream of vitamin A, so it's um, less likely to have off target or side effects because obviously vitamin A is really important. Mm. But um, if it's orally taken, do not other cells also require this retinoic acid receptor or is it uniquely expressed in um, the the testes? So yeah, retinoic acid receptor is broadly expressed, but there, there, are, there are two ways to think about this. Firstly, that there are, there are um, three units, alpha, beta, gamma, and we're only inhibiting alpha. And so where there's a need for other retin, for, for retinoic acid signaling, beta and gamma can pick up the slack. The other is actually that, you know, there's a lot of research on the role of retinoic acid receptors as it pertains to embryonic development. But afterwards, there's not a lot of clear data as to what is the role of retinoic acid receptor beyond its, its importance in sperm cell development. And so, you know, it is why we think we're, we don't show toxicity at therapeutic doses is because by and large, the animals don't actually need retinoic acid receptor alpha. Interesting. And so obviously you've now developed this um, oral non-hormonal uh, pill, and I believe you're now testing it in clinical trials. Would you be able to speak more about how um, the stage of this pill is at the moment? Sure. So we're currently conducting a phase 1A clinical trial in the UK to try and assess safety and tolerability of YCT529, this male contraceptive pill that we're developing. And uh, this is predominantly to, to take a step-by-step -step approach to ensure that uh, regulators who have never seen a non-hormonal contraceptive pill 
before, feel comfortable with the first step. You know, so like, you know, uh, the development of a non-hormonal contraceptive pill or the, the development of YC2529 is historic in a few ways in that, again, it's the first non-hormonal contraceptive pill ever. Women may have had a contraceptive pill for 60 plus years, but they have never, there's never been a non-hormonal contraceptive pill studied for women. So th that's the first. And secondly, I think, again, it's a, it's a non-hormonal contraceptive pill for men, like that in and itself is, is historic. And so in the, in this development, I think we have to think about who are stakeholders in this process. Regulators are stakeholders. They've never, they've never reviewed a molecule like this clearly. And so we have to take baby steps to make sure that they're comfortable. Um, men are stakeholders. They want to ensure that, that they are uh, safe. So that, that is something we have to take into consideration. I think another consideration is women. Women are also stakeholders in the development of a male contraceptive. How do you build trust there as well? Uh, so it is how we are taking a step-by-step -step approach to ensure that everyone is comfortable as we continue to develop uh, a male contraceptive. I, I think another, you know, another point of consideration in the fact that this is the first non-hormonal contraceptive pill and that women have had contraceptive pills for 60 years is like, why has no one ever developed a non-hormonal contraceptive pill for women? I was going to ask you this question. Yeah, you know, I think, is there a perception that because, you know, hormonal methods are highly effective, that the problem is solved and that there's no more work that we need to do here? I think that's a perception. But, you know, the data suggests that women are actually, the side effect profiles of hormonal methods are so um, poorly tolerated that they're in fact willing to go to less effective methods of contraception to prevent pregnancy. In conclusion, reproductive health is a complex and multifaceted issue. It requires ongoing discussion, research and support to ensure that women and men have control over their reproductive choices. We owe it to ourselves and to the future generations to build a world where reproductive rights are respected and we're empowered to make decisions that affect our bodies our lives and our futures. But I'll leave it to Akesh to have the final word. It's not, it is just not a scientific endeavor. It is actually one that I think along the path brings about um, a societal change. And I think as a result, brings up a lot of questions that are not scientific that are being addressed along the path.